Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Be prepared. That's the motto of the Scouts, as I shared in the children's message. This refers to the practice that are taught to the Scouts, to make sure that you can plan for the eventualities on whatever trip you're going on where you're going to be engaging with the world. Because you don't, need to tell, you don't need me to tell you that the world doesn't always follow the plan that you think it's going to. And the events of your trip, your hike, your camping trip, whatever it may be, they don't always go according to plan. I recall a story that I heard from my dad about when he went to Philmont when he was in high school. And Philmont is a really big Boy Scout camp in New Mexico. And you do big, long hiking treks where you have to carry everything you bring with you, food, water, all your equipment. So your packs can weigh anywhere from 50 to 75 pounds, depending on when you just picked up your food or not. Well, they have bears out there that also like human food. And so in order to account for that, they have bear lines and bear bags. So you toss a rope over a big steel cable they have up in the trees, and you hoist up everything that could smell appetizing to a bear, which is some of those items are quite surprising. And you hope that they'll be there in the morning. Well, on one of my dad's trips, apparently, there was a pine tree near where the bear line was at, and it was small enough to where the bear climbed up that tree, and the tree leaned over, and he swiped the bags open, and then my dad's troop had to survive on hot cocoa mix and water for two and a half days. Didn't go according to plan. So in that motto, you're taught to ask yourself, what do I need? How do I prepare myself for whatever trip I'm going to take? What do I have that I need to deal with? What may occur? And many of those items are fairly common now. Something to make fire with, some good shoes, especially if you're hiking, something to shelter you from the rain, a poncho or rain suit, uh, a knife, something to make tools with or cut rope with, a water bottle or a way to purify water in nature, and a basic first aid kit. The list goes on and on. So you ask yourself, are you prepared? And I have to tell you, even outside of scouting, that mantra has served me very well. And I'm sure for those of you who have been in scouts or were taught that lesson in some other fashion, you recognize the value of that pretty much in all the aspects of your life. When you leave the house every morning, you do some degree of preparation. Well, does that apply? We said all aspects of our life. Does that apply to our Christian life? as well? Does that apply to the life of faith? And in our gospel reading today, Jesus seems to be teaching us that it does, that there are things that are coming that, in fact, we do need to be prepared for, and that we are not left to our own devices in order to do that. So today, you may not know, is the second to last Sunday of the church year, And the last two Sundays of the church year, the theme is always looking at the eschaton, the end times of the world, and what our God has promised us in those days. And so we're looking at the final consummation of the gospel promise of salvation in Jesus from our God. And so Jesus is talking about preparation for this day that he's going to come back and everything that is going to occur before then. Now, Jesus is actually speaking in our gospel reading about two events. He's, of course, speaking about the end times, the return of Christ, the day of judgment, the day of the Lord, but he's also talking about something more immediate for his disciples, and that is the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD by the Romans. Now, lest you think that's just some day in history, for those who would be listening to Jesus, what he is describing to them is the destruction of the city of God and the house of God, the Almighty, where he dwells among his people. That is a shocking thing to say. 
that was the temple in Jerusalem was the central aspect of life for God's chosen people. And Jesus just tells his disciples that there's not going to be one stone left laid upon another, totally destroyed. So this whole discourse starts with a bunch of his disciples. They're looking at the temple and they're like, man, the temple is grand and it's mighty and look at all these noble stones that are holding it up. And just to give you an idea, some of the largest stones used in the construction of the second temple, Herod's temple, weighed over 100 tons. So they were 45 by 11 by 36 feet in one solid stone object. Man, if you can't count on that lasting, what can you count on lasting? So they're, 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 they're adoring this temple and what it stands for. And then Jesus, just sort of as a buzzkill in the midst of their, their, their thinking here, his response to their adoration is, as for these things that you see, the days will come when there not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Way to ruin the mood, Jesus. They're just talking about how amazing this thing is. And, and from a human standpoint, it is incredible. I mean, can you imagine how the heck they would move something of that magnitude? And it's made up of a bunch of those things, this massive construction. And yet... Jesus is saying, let's focus on something else because that's, that's passing away. So no matter how grand or mighty the temple, it's not going to last. And so Jesus is saying, be prepared for when this is going to occur. What you thought was permanent and strong is going to perish. And if the temple is going to be destroyed, it's going to signify two main things to the people of God. One, the presence of God among his people is no longer in the temple. Something is going to change because Jesus doesn't in his discourse here talk about abandoning the people of God. So the temple is no longer going to be the place where God dwells among his people. And two, that even the sturdiest things of this world don't last forever. So then he goes on as if the destruction of the temple is not enough. The natural response to Jesus' proclamation, of course, is a bunch of questions that are oriented around how are we going to deal with this, right? Their response is, teacher, when are these things going to be and what will be a sign when they're about to take place? Those are questions of preparation. Whether their preparation is to, if you let me know when that's going to happen, I'm going to make sure I'm somewhere else. Or if you let me know when that's going to happen, I'm going to figure out a way to prevent it from happening. Pretty natural questions after something so shocking. But then Jesus is shocking again. He just sort of ignores the question. And starts talking about not being led astray by false teachers. That many are going to come and say that I am he and that the time is now. But do not follow after them. There's going to be wars and calamities plagues and persecution and then through verses 10 through 18 he talks about what's going to happen to those who follow him and here we're still in the section where he's talking about in the next like 40 years after his ascension and if you want to read about more detail there go to the acts of the apostles he's talking about all that stuff that's going to happen and here's what he says is going to happen you're going to be brought before kings and governors because of my name. You're going to be handed over to those people by family and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you, they'll put to death. Now, if you think about that, it's really interesting, is this path that he has sketched out here for his disciples is the very same path that he himself is on as he's speaking to them. He's going to be delivered over to kings and rulers of the world. He's going to be betrayed by those closest to him and handed over. And he's going to be put to death. And so Jesus is saying to those who are following him, your life will be like mine, for it is now attached to yours. And the world rejects me. 
And the reason he gives for why all of that is going to occur to you, to the disciple of Jesus, to the apostles whom he's sending out into the world, is simply for my name's sake. Just by association with me will these things occur. But then he closes this section with an interesting thing. Right after he says, some of you are going to be put to death, he says this, but not a hair on your head will perish. And through your endurance, your, your lives will be saved. They will be preserved. How does that make sense? Some of you are going to die, but not a hair on your head will perish. We'll come back to that. Then he goes on and says, when Jerusalem is surrounded by armies, you will know its doom is at hand. It's going to be trampled underfoot, and God's people are going to be scattered throughout the world, imprisoned by many nations. It's a lot. Especially coming from Jesus. Imagine that in the scenario I sketched out before that you're about to embark on a scouting trip and then you're told all this is going to happen while you're on it. What does that equipment list look like? How the heck do I prepare for that? Well, let's look at a couple of pieces in here. There's a few key verses in the midst of all of this projection of disaster that give us an insight into where Jesus is directing our attention. He says, do not be led astray by false teachers. Well, how do we do that? How do we not get led astray other than clinging to the Word of God, heeding the words of our Lord Jesus, and not the other words that seek to draw us astray? So when, when somebody says the time is at hand, you probably can all think of somebody specific that's fairly common, that somebody says, I know when the world's going to end and where it's going to end, so sell all your stuff and come over here with me. And then what always ends up happening? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, got the math wrong, sorry, um, it's this time. And then after a few of those, people are like, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. Right? And then you can say, well, Jesus told you a long time ago that would be the case, right? So we cling to God's word for our source of truth and our source of what God is up to. He says, I will give you a mouth and a wisdom to those who are brought before the kings and the governors, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. And again, I would direct you to the book of Acts. This occurs multiple times. A lowly apostle, really of no account in the world, is brought before mighty rulers and speaks the message of the gospel and gives an account for Jesus and they're met either with protection or release. And they're able to tell many people about God's word. It's their opportunity to witness. But we too, today as followers of Jesus, are given a mouth and wisdom. It comes from God's word. We don't speak our own words, but rather we speak his. We don't testify to ourselves, but rather we testify about him. And what he has done. And then he said the phrase that I talked about before, not a hair on your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your lives. Not a hair on your head is going to perish even though some of you are going to be put to death. How do we make sense of that? Well, we make sense of that by understanding where Jesus is going and what he does. He's going to Jerusalem, and the very thing which he conquers there and triumphs over is death. Death, where is your sting? It is no more. Death can no longer hold him, and because of faith in Jesus and your life now being wrapped up in his, death no longer holds you. Death is no longer the thing that destroys you, because death is the wages of sin, and your sins have been forgiven. So not a hair on your head will perish. This is one of the things that always fascinated me about people who studied the early church, especially those who came from a non-faith position. The thing that always rattles their suspicions of the church is the fact that so many, if this was a lie, why do so many people 
die for it. It's right here. Because they believe that death no longer holds dominion over them. That not a hair of their head will perish. Jesus promised them that. And so how do we endure all the things the world is going to throw at us? We cling to Christ, the Word made flesh. We hold fast to His teachings So you should ask yourself today the same question that they teach the Boy Scouts and maybe your parents taught you to ask yourself, am I prepared? Not for some camping trip or some vacation, but am I prepared for the return of my Lord? For the consummation of the promise of the gospel which I received in my baptism and am continually sustained in through His promises and the giving of His body and blood. If Jesus returns tomorrow, am I ready? Or a week from now, or a year from now? After all, a few chapters before in Luke 17, Jesus described the day of the Lord as something that's going to occur when you're in the midst of doing everything that you normally do on a day-to-day basis. You're going to be coming and going to work, coming and going to school, eating, preparing dinner, picking up the kids from practice, getting ready to go to bed. Am I prepared for his return? The answer to the disciples of Jesus, he he gives at the very end of this reading. You will be prepared by faith in him. So those of faith are indeed prepared for this day, whether it's tomorrow or a week from now or 10 years from now, because of Christ. Christ. And the gift of faith you've received through his word. See how he describes it at the end here of our reading in 27 and 28. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads. Because your redemption is drawing near. No fear. No sadness. He says, straighten up, raise your head. Your endurance has paid off. The word is being totally fulfilled. Your redemption is drawing near. The final consummation of God's promise and salvation for you in Jesus is here. Your sins, they've been forgiven. You have been named a child of God in your baptism Death no longer has dominion over you, for your life has been swallowed up in Christ. Am I prepared? Yes. In Jesus, I am prepared. In the name of Jesus, amen.